By giving you no time instead of it all Till the pain is so big you feel nothing at all Less than 12 months ago, Daniel Cormier faced off for the second time against his bitterest rival, John Jones. After a couple of close competitive rounds, the fight ended in a devastating fashion. Jones unleashed a wicked head kick and descended like the fucking Grim Reaper. Cormier's post-fight interview was not at all pretty. He was confused, he was distraught, he was sobbing into the microphone. Utter devastation. But it was nothing to be ashamed of. It was just the other side of the brutal double-edged sword with which he had carved his way through two divisions. It was the agony of confronting crushing failure in the light of great expectations. On that night, he failed. He fell short while giving 100 fucking percent. And he went out on his shield with the heart of a champion. But there was just something about the manner in which he went out on his shield. After watching hundreds of events... I'm pretty much desensitized to the usual run-of-the-mill Saturday night brutality that transpires in the octagon. But if there's one individual who can shatter that false sense of numbness, it's John Jones. We've seen him administer some horrific beatdowns and score some wicked finishes. And this one was especially grim. I was rooting for Jones, but shortly afterwards, he popped for steroids. And that cast a vicious victory I had celebrated in a whole new light. I found it incredibly frustrating that a man who had already failed multiple drug tests would swan in, snatch the belt, fail a test, and potentially destroy two amazing careers in one night. I know you can't really predict the moment a fighter's chin goes, or they start winding down, but I honestly felt this would be the moment people look back at and said, yeah. This is where Cormier began his slide out of the sport. Beyond the psychological ramifications of losing to his fiercest rival in the most devastating manner, he was 38 years old, had been in a couple of wars, and eaten some big shots at light heavyweight. And now, he had been stopped in a manner that would rattle the cage of even the most sadistic fans. How could he possibly bounce back? I thought the most likely sequence of events here would be that Cormier would get into another gunfight with someone like Gustafson, Gus would land one of those shots he had already landed many times, and Cormier would pass the torch. But Cormier did what he'd been doing for more than 20 years. He ate the loss, strapped what felt like a silver medal belt around his waist, and began moving forward. I always say, man, there's levels. There's levels to this game, and... He's going to realize a different level whenever we fight January 20th. At UFC 220, Cormier defended his newly reinstated light heavyweight strap against Vulcan Uzdemir. DC backed up his words and proved that yes, there are levels to this game. He took Vulcan down in his second and cuddled him till the ref stepped in. Made it look easy. And in doing so, he made an emphatic statement. Down but not out. John Jones beat me, but he didn't fucking break me. I've done everything right. And I've just been dragged down by this guy constantly. So I'm not thinking about it. I'm going to do my thing for right now. Over the same period, an elite heavyweight monster had began to forge his own legacy, building a solid case as the greatest heavyweight in UFC history. Since losing to Junior Dos Santos, Stipe Miocic administered one of the worst beatdowns of Mark Hunt's career, which is really saying something. He decimated Arlaski in under a minute, snatched the belt from Verdum like he was snatching a cat out of a tree. He then scored back-to-back first-round knockouts over two of the most revered strikers in the division, crushing over him on the ground and decimating Junior DeSantos on a feet. But arguably his most impressive victory in a streak wasn't a stoppage over a legend of the sport. It was his win over Francis Ngannou, a genetic freak in nature, right in his prime, and on a deadly streak of violence of his own. A man who was getting touted as the future of the heavyweight division. Stipe fought an incredibly smart fight, controlled Ngannou, and whooped his ass from pillar to post. Evidently, he snatched his soul in the process. Amazing performance. And if the streak said anything, it said that Stipe is a complete fighter. 
with sinister power in his hands, capable of knocking out big, strong, durable heavyweights with near zero wind-up. Against Vulcan, Cormier had proved he had recovered psychologically, which said a lot about the guy. But although Vulcan had landed a couple of shots, he hadn't really tested the durability of DC. Stipe Miocic, the heavyweight power-punching machine, would surely prove to be a much more formidable test in that regard. The build-up for the fight was largely uneventful. It was two guys with a lot of mutual respect, virtually no animosity. And so the framing of the fight didn't go beyond answering one single question. A question that only the highest level heavyweight fight can answer. In an absolute sense, who is the greatest fighter on the fucking planet? Cormier mentioned people counting him out and doubting him, and I was firmly in that camp. I knew he had amazing success at heavyweight before, but for me the tale of the tape was simply a list of reasons to count his ass out. Pushing 40 and 4 years older, giving up 5 inches of height, almost 8 fucking inches in reach, and being one year removed from a devastating KO finish that was burned into my mind. I couldn't see him controlling Stipe, and felt over five rounds, Miocic would land something big on a chin Jones had just shattered. And that would be all she wrote. Cormier's prior success at heavyweight, impressive as it was, hadn't been against a fighter like Stipe, who was right in his prime, smashing records, and had all the momentum and confidence in the world. And that, for me, is one of the most impressive things about it. Heavyweight is notoriously thin. Cormier, who could have easily stuck around a division he had already cleared out, elected to move up at a time when the division finally had a dominant champion. Bold move. But Cormier's an astute analyst, and so he must have been acutely aware of the fact that no matter what he did at light heavyweight, it would always be somewhat undermined by his bitter rival. One of the most common soundbites in the buildup was about legacy, entering the discussion of the greatest fighters to ever compete. For many, Cormier was already in that discussion, but not in the same way as numerous other fighters who had at some point undeniably been the greatest fighter in their division. Cormier's title reign at light heavyweight did have the feeling of an interim belt. It was pretty clear from his sound bites that despite everything he'd accomplished, Cormier felt he needed to add one more accolade to his considerable resume. Something untainted, something undeniable, indisputable and snatching the crown from the most dominant heavyweight in history fit the bill perfectly. The fight got off to a quick start and was initially exactly what I expected. Stipe tagged him and appeared to have a strength advantage, but any shots landed Cormier ate with ease are deflected away with his shoulder. Couple eye pokes, the first of which it looked especially egregious, but a point deduction was never coming into play here. In the last 30 seconds, they briefly clinched, and on the break, Cormier bucked his usual trend of throwing uppercuts and instead threw a wicked right hook. Molly whopped the fuck out of his ass and unleashed some vicious ground and pound before the ref stepped in. The finishing sequence was startling, came out of nowhere, the fight was over before I even knew what landed. And just like that, at 39 years of age, Cormier was finally wearing a belt that was indisputable. For the first time in his career, he was undeniably the greatest fighter in his weight class. And that weight class was heavyweight, making him the greatest fighter on the fucking planet. At the post-fight press conference, Cormier was relaxed but visibly ecstatic. And there's really no reason to paraphrase a guy. He himself framed the victory in the most poignant terms. Oh, Kevin, you know, it's not even, it didn't start with, uh, with Jones. It dates back to 2000, when I was 15 years old. I went to the World Championships and got third. Um, I was second in the NCAA Championships to Kale Sanderson. In the Olympic semifinals, I lost to one of the 10 greatest wrestlers of all time to finish fourth. And then to come and fight Jones and lose twice, you know, it's, I've come up short in a lot of situations, but all those situations are earned. They don't say, well, DC, you're a great guy. We're going to put you in these big spots. I just had never been able to cash in. And tonight I was able to cash in, and it's, it's just the most amazing thing. It almost feels like destiny. Like Cormier had been competing at an elite level since 95. 
He was a standout since he was a teenager and won some serious tournaments along the way. It'd probably take a week to polish a guy's trophy case. But he was never quite number one on an international level. Even when he finally snapped up a UFC belt and cleared out a division, he labored in the shadow of his bitterest rival. The specter of John Jones loomed large over the light heavyweight division. And so in a pretty cruel twist of fate, the greatest part of Cormier's legacy had been tainted by his worst enemy. But Cormier's career had been largely shaped and defined by two men. Defined by his rivalry with Jones, but shaped by his friendship with Cain Velasquez. Throughout the build-up, Cormier repeatedly thanked Cain for welcoming him into a team as a novice and helping him become the fighter he is. When Cormier entered the UFC, it was his unwillingness to challenge his teammate for the belt that precipitated his move to light heavyweight. And so I found it especially impressive that at the very first opportunity to speak, after finally stepping out of Jones' shadow, the very first moment in 25 years of battling monsters where he could say he is without question a true undisputed world champion and the greatest fighter on the planet, that instead of basking in the glory of that title and taking the opportunity to gloat in the face of the enemy who defined his career, he humbly offered that title to the friend who had helped shape it. When you consider all the shit this guy crawled through to get to the mountaintop, I thought this was just fucking exceptional. He's, man, let me tell you something. The reason the fight was so easy today was because, again, for the last eight weeks I've been getting beat up by Cain yeah. Velasquez. He's still the best, man. He's the best heavyweight the UFC's ever seen. He does things that you just don't expect somebody to do. I left the heavyweight division ranked the number two guy in the world, though, and... I didn't get to fulfill my journey in this division because Kane was the champ. And if I had to make that same decision today, I would do the same thing and went down because I would never fight Kane. And I never would have done this tonight without him and all the rest of my training partners. But he's been, what Velasquez has been to me is unbelievable. It's unmatched that he showed me that becoming a champion was possible because he's the first guy from AK to do it. And, uh, told me on numerous occasions that there was no way I could lose this fight tonight. Trained with me tirelessly, uh, put himself on the line, and I really appreciate him for it. He's a great friend. I love that guy. In a previous video, I mentioned playing a brash trash talker. It doesn't really work for Daniel Cormier. But humble and gracious, that fit him like a fucking glove. My favorite part of the post-fight press conference was his own incredulity in the face of what just happened. I'm 39 years old. Things start to hurt a little bit more as you age. You guys ever think about, like, I'm 39 years old and I just did this. This is the craziest thing in the world. There's not too many things in life more satisfying than really surprising yourself. And reaching the pinnacle of a sport after 25 fucking years of crushing fingertip misses, well, that gotta be satisfying as a motherfucker. This fight represented a definitive fork in the road for Daniel Cormier's legacy. Had he failed, he'd likely be remembered as a two-time Olympian who made an outstanding late transition to become one of the great fighters of his era. But one who, in the cruelest twist of fate, largely labored in the shadow of a sworn enemy. But this time Cormier didn't fail. This time Cormier didn't fall short. At UFC 226, he made history. The ultimate career redemption. And he once and for all ascended in a legendary status undeniable legendary status. What an incredible fucking victory.